So uh, today we're going to talk about linear model selection and regularized fitting. So you may remember uh, multivariate linear regression. So in multivariate, multivariate regression, we had y hat, which we estimate using this, uh, this function. And using ordinary least squares, so OLS, uh, we're going to estimate these beta parameters. Uh, so this is very simple and useful, but there are situations where uh, we want something more than multivariate regression. So one situation is when we have a data set that looks like this. We have a data set where number of features is more than the number of samples. So in this situation, ordinary squares cannot estimate these parameters. Uh, so that's, that's one issue. Another issue, so this is the first possible problem. The second problem is interpretability. So in situations where number of predictors is large, um, if you use multivariate regression and there are a large number of predictors that uh, get non-zero coefficients from ordinary squares, it means that they have some uh, effect to the response, to the predicted response. And if you want to use this model, not for prediction, but for understanding how we can change the response, uh, then a model with many predictors is not useful. For example, in the medical setting, if you are using a large number of, let's say, um, variables that we can measure for, for a patient to predict you know, the outcome of some treatment. A model where there are many predictors would not be useful because that may involve uh, a medical procedure that involves uh, you know, taking many you know, measurements from the, from the patient and therefore it would be costly. So for the practitioner in the medical setting, they would prefer maybe a model with just you know, three or four predictors compared to let's say tens or hundreds of predictors. So that's another situation where we may prefer, um, let's say, a, a sparse model. So a sparse model means a model with fewer predictors than uh, the original number of potential predictors that we have. Um, and another issue, another issue is, is overfitting. So um, even if we can like, find a way to um, you know, uh, resolve this issue of, of uh, these coefficients, when we deal with a data set like this, we are likely to overfit uh, if we use multivariate regression because there are you know, not enough samples um, to, to estimate you know, parameters for these many predictors. So for these three reasons, we may need sparse models. So sparse models um, require us to uh, do model selection. So model selection in here means that when we have p predictors, uh, there are many potential models that we can use uh, containing a subset of these predictors. So if we use this predictor and this one and this one, we're going to get a sparse model with three predictors, right? And this is only one case out of two to the power of p possible models, because for each model, if each predictor is either in or out. That's why there are two possibilities for each predictor and two to the power of p total possibilities for you know, models we can have with you know, fewer than p predictors. So this is the main challenge that we're going to talk about today, and there are three main approaches. So the first approach is um, linear model selection. This involves evaluating some of these 2 to the power of p models and in a systematic way uh, choose one of them as the best model. So with linear model selection, we talked about some of this a bit earlier in the course. Uh, there are three alternatives. One of them is best subset selection. Uh, then we have forward stepwise selection and we have backward stepwise selection. And we're going to see their differences. Uh, then the second overall approach that we can have for getting a sparse model is regularized fitting. So regularized fitting means that uh, we include all of these predictors, but instead of using OLS as the tool for estimating these parameters, we use a different uh, fitting procedure. And that different fitting procedure is going to have some uh, penalty for estimating a model with large values for the uh, coefficients. So for regularized fitting, you may remember these from APS 1070. Um, these are the methods when we have L1 norm or L2 norm penalty in the objective function. So one of them is ridge regression, and the other one is lasso regression. So ridge regression is when we have L2 norm penalty, and lasso is where we have L1 norm. And we're going to talk about this in detail. 
Uh, then a third approach, um, which is probably not as popular as the previous two approaches, um, is using dimensionality reduction. So again, you may remember dimensionality reduction from APS 1070, but if you haven't passed that course, it's okay. We're going to cover you know, uh, the basics of principal component analysis. So with dimensionality reduction, again, there are essentially two methods. Uh, we have PCR, something we are familiar with for COVID, I guess, but this PCR doesn't involve a nasal swap, so that's good. This is principal component regression. And we have PLS, which is partial least squares. So this pretty much summarizes the topics we're going to talk about today. So any questions so far? No? All right, so let's start with linear model selection and best offset selection. So with best offset selection, uh, we systematically compare all the possible models that we can have with up to P predictors. So the data set that we have has N samples and P predictors or P variables or P features, and each of these features can be in or out, right? So in best offset selection, we're going to actually fit all the possible two to the P models. We compare them systematically and choose the best model. But we need to do this systematically. So, um, so there's a three-step process for best offset selection. So in step one, so we fit all the possible to the P models. Uh, this step actually is going to take some time, because if there are P predictors, let's say, um, as an example, let's say P equals 5. So what we need to do is um, fit one model that doesn't have any predictors in it. It's just the average of y values. So there's one model um, with no predictor. And there are five models with one predictor. Right? Because there are five columns. If you select column one, that gives us one univariate model. If you select column two, that gives us one univariate regression model. And that's why in total we have five. Then there are 10 models with two predictors. Uh, there are, again, 10 models with three predictors. There are five models with four predictors. Why is it five? Because in each of these five models, one predictor is out, the other four are, are in. And then there's one model with all five predictors. So when you add up these numbers, when you add up these numbers, this gives you 32, which is 2 to the power of 5. Same thing as 2 to the power of p. So this step one, while it's very simple, it looks very simple, it takes you know, quite a long time. Especially if p is large, uh, it's not even you know, possible. So when p is, let's say, 10, how many models do you think we need to fit? Anyone? Something around 1,000, right? 2 to the power of 10 is 1,024. Uh, so this is when you know, we have a data set with 10 columns. Um, and if p is 40, the answer is totally different, because it's going to be 2 to the power of 40, which is around this number. So 2 to the power of 40 is such a huge number, but actually having 40 predictors is very normal. You know, whenever you have a data set with 40 columns for x, uh, you're in this situation. What this means is that best subset selection only works if p is, uh, let's say, you know, a small value, such that 2 to the p would be a manageable number of models. All right, so this is only step one. Then in step two, we're going to find m sub j for all values of j as the best model with j predictors. So for example, here, we have five models with one predictor. And we can compare them based on their r squared. So we pick one of them and call it M1. Then here, there are 10 models with two predictors. We can compare them based on R squared. The model that has the highest R squared has captured the largest variance using two predictors. We call that M sub 2. So for all values of J, which means for all of these rows, we're going to pick the best model that has J predictors uh, using R squared or RSS. 
So just to refresh you on uh, these two concepts, RSS was the residual sum of squares was this total when we have our predictor for instance i and the actual value of the response for instance i, when we take this difference and square it um, and go over all the values from 1 to n, this gives us RSS. So when RSS is 0, it means that we have captured all the variance. And R squared is 1 minus RSS over TSS. TSS was the total variation of y around its mean. So it's y bar minus yi squared. So when RSS is lower, it's better, right? And when R squared is higher, it's better, right? So between these five models with one predictor, we're going to pick the model that has highest R squared, which is equivalent to picking the model that has lowest RSS, right? It just means that we're picking the model that has captured higher variance with this limitation of having one predictor. So from this second step, uh, we're going to have this set, essentially, of m0, m1, m2, mj, all the way to mp. Right? This is m0 is this one. m1 is the best from this row. m2 is the best from out of these 10. m3 is the best out of these 10. m4 is the best out of these 5. And m5 is just this one that has everything. So then in step 3, we're going to pick the single best model out of out of these models using cross-validation. So the normal thing is to use cross-validation. This is because we cannot use R squared to compare performance of this and performance of this. Because with R squared, whenever we have more predictors, R squared will be higher. You know, when we increase predictors, R squared cannot get any worse. It just gets better and better. Because if you have a model, let's say, with three predictors, it has a certain value of r squared, right? So let's say p is 3 and r squared is 0.7. Now if we use the same three predictors um, and add a new predictor, uh, the worst thing that can happen is that um, r squared can stay the same. This is the worst possible outcome. Because uh, what this means is that here y hat was you know, some y hat was something like this, and these values were estimated. So now, the worst thing that can happen is that you know, the lowest performance that we can have is keeping the same coefficient plus 0x4, right? And everything like before. So let me just give you some numbers instead of these coefficients. So let's say a model that performs like this has 0.4 here, 0.6 here, 1.2 here, and let's say minus 0.7 here. Now, the worst model, you know, the lowest performance of a model with p equal 4 is going to be a model that matches with the previous model in terms of its coefficients for, um, for x1 all the way to x3 and the intercept, and then just put 0 for x4. This is essentially the same model as this one, only here there are four predictors, here there are three predictors. Therefore, r squared, when we increase p, when we increase, uh, let's say, number of um, predictors, r squared cannot get any worse. That's why for this step three in here, we should use something like cross-validation. We cannot just use R squared. Because if you use R squared, we are comparing apples and oranges. Because this is the apples word. This is where the number of predictors is three. And this is oranges word, where predictors are four. We cannot compare them directly using R squared, because when we increase the number of predictors, R squared cannot decrease. That's why we use something like cross-validation. There are a couple of other alternatives that are uh, mentioned in your textbook. Um, eventually, we would prefer cross-validation. So I don't want to confuse you with the other methods. But just so that you know there are some other alternatives, there are some methods li like Mallow's CP, AIC, BIC, and adjusted R squared. So these are methods um, that allow us to do some sort of comparison like this um, using some mathematical adjustment uh, that makes apples and oranges comparable. So it's kind of a you know, duct tape solution because it just mathematically uh, adjusts for the fact that uh, these are not directly comparable. Therefore, we can get adjusted version of these, and they are called adjusted R squared, and then we can compare them. But as long as we have cross-validation, that's the preferred alternative, because these methods, they all have some limitations. But cross-validation works in all different settings. Any questions? 
All right, so this, this was best subset selection. Um, it's you know, very theoretically simple because we're comparing all the possible models in a systematic way. Uh, but as we saw earlier, it only works where number of predictors is, let's say, less than 20. Because 2 to the power of 20 is still manageable. Uh, but you know, pretty much any number higher than that, we wouldn't use best subset selection because of the uh, computation cost and also because of overfitting. If we you know, explore such a large space of possible models, if we compare if you somehow fit all these many you know, models and pick the best of them, uh, that is going to be overfit because it's in such a huge space of possibilities with these many you know, comparisons, and it automatically becomes something that looks perfect on the training data. And then on the test data, it wouldn't uh, work that well. Yeah. So this method that you doesn't consider the like, nonlinear transformation or the higher order? No, this is linear. So uh, this method and the other two methods I'm going to discuss are linear model selection. Yeah. All right, let's take a quick break, and then we're going to discuss these two methods.